they come back every time I think I lost them. We are here with a very interesting man, Alan Cozen, and um, you have a very literate world in your world, is this right? Um, well, I suppose. I mean, it's you know, through books and things. Yeah, <laughs> you've written a lot of things. Um, I have written a lot of things as well. And, and you have written things uh, about the Beatles as well. Yes. Can you talk about it? Um, well, <clears throat> I guess there are, there, are, there are two categories of things I do about the Beatles. One is, um, you know, in, my, in my real life, I work for the New York Times. OK. And um, for about 35 years, I was a, mainly a classical music critic. Um, and now I'm a culture reporter. Um, and all through that, um, I've basically been our um, Beatles desk, as it were. Um, were you because, elected, or did you choose it? Well, you know, what happened was, uh, in about 1987, our chief pop critic, John Perellas, wrote a review of a video called The Beatles Live. Um, and The Beatles Live wasn't actually live, but it was sort of live. It was tricky. Was it lip sync? Well, yes and uh, yes, sort of. Oh. Um, but what it was was that they actually had gone, it wasn't like they were lip syncing to the records. They had gone in and recorded right. the stuff People new. People do that. And then lip synced it when they filmed it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so John knew that it was not the records he was used to, but he didn't know that it wasn't really a live performance, and so he wrote his review and I sent him a note with this obsessive detail. Oh, so they did it so well that this guy didn't even know? Right. Okay. Yeah. It was actually from a TV show called Around the Beatles, which aired in 1964. Oh, wow. And, so they um, played it safe even back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it was, um, you know, it was put out on videotape at the time and packaged as the Beatles Live rather than Around the Beatles. So, um, you know, that, that was how it looked. And so I wrote him a note and I said, uh, you know, this is, this is what actually happened. And, uh, and, he, and not long after that, the Beatles' first CDs were going to come out. And he said, listen, why don't you do these? And you can, you know, write a big piece and, you know, do all of your disco mania and whatever you want to do. And so I did that, and uh, and ever since then, basically, whenever there's been some sort of a Beatle event or because a release, you know. They, you know, they, they do it. And, and Perellas actually went and gave a talk at the Juilliard School, um, mm -hmm. which is odd because, you know, that's really a classical music. That would have been you, that right? Be. Yeah. So, so our pop critic went to a classical music school, gave a talk, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. and um, said, you know, the New York Times is the only newspaper with a full-time Beatles desk, and it's in the classical wow. music department. So, um, yeah. It's well, I guess fun. the Beatles are classic. Absolutely. Exactly. Classical, Absolutely. maybe, maybe, but... Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, you know? right? I mean, they had... Um, Conductors like Leonard Bernstein um, right. just said that they were, uh, you know, the Schuberts of our time. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. Now, do you think that they were, or they just were at the right place at the right time? Uh, well, you know, we've heard an awful lot of other bands from that time and other songwriters and from that not, time. And they're not, they don't equal. Yeah, not quite. No, know. it's true. So, I mean, there's great stuff from those days. I mean, right. I love the Stones and Dave Five sure. and the whole thing. Okay. But it's not quite at that level. It's not the Beatles. No, it isn't. It's not. So, do you remember your first Beatle experience? Yeah. Yeah, I was probably nine years old with my father and brother in, in Sears Roebuck in um, Yonkers, where I grew up. Okay. And um, uh, they came on the radio, and I mean, I knew, you know, everyone had heard about the Beatles, right? and this was late December 63, so everyone knew that there was something going on and that, uh, you know, we needed to know what it was, but I hadn't heard them yet. Right. Um, and the song came on, I guess it would have been I Want to Hold Your Hand, and um, so, you know, listened to it with some interest. I guess I hadn't totally made up my mind at the moment. I, I just wanted to hear what it was sure. rather than decide if I liked it. Um, and strangely, if it turns out that the, the second of the Beatles' books I've done is um, actually all about I Want to Hold Your Hand. 
around. It's called Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Wow. And it's an ebook. And uh, the, the New York Times and Byliner collaboratively published it. And, uh, you know, it just talks about basically how that song, well, first of all, came about. Um, and also how... How it, did it come about? Um, well, you know, they, it was time to write a single, and they sat down and wrote a single. I mean, that part is, is kind of prosaic, but um, there are some interesting things that happened along the way. For instance, it was, it was the first time they used four-track recording technology. Oh. Before that, they were using two-track, and four-track opened a whole world. Was it at Abbey Road? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, almost everything they did was at Abbey Road. Um, you know, and they wrote it in um, Jane Asher's basement. Jane Asher was Paul McCartney's girlfriend at the time. She was also, at the time, already a very accomplished actress. Um, and uh, Paul McCartney had a room up in their attic, actually. Across the hall from Peter. Yes, and Peter, Peter was Jane's brother. Um, Peter, I guess, will be at Beatles Fest yes. as well, and uh, I should talk to him actually because he um, apparently, after they wrote the song, uh, they called him down to yes. the basement and said, "Give what us a listen." Think? Right. You know? and John Paul was sitting at the piano and playing. Yeah, I mean that must have been. But nice they were job, kids. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, they were already like twenty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think Paul was twenty. Yeah, this was their fifth oh, okay. single, so All right. you know. And, but that's uh, pretty young, right? Yeah, but they were, they were seasoned by then already. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had five, four singles out and one album out, and had pretty much come close to finishing their second album um, when it was time to record this. And um, you know, George Martin, their producer, had basically insisted that they bring in hits, because the first thing they brought in was Love Me Do, and Love Me Do is a great song, but it's not the best Beatles song. Right. You know, it's very simple, and it's um, fairly primitive, and he wasn't that impressed with it. Um, and he wanted them to bring in something better, and so the next thing they brought in was Please Please Me, which he had heard an early version of and didn't like, because they had done it really slowly. and. Sort of like a Roy Orbison song is the way they characterized it. Um, and he said, you know, give it something. And they sped it up and they made it a lot more energetic. And it became the song we know. And it's a great song. Then From Me to You and um, She Loves You. And then finally, um, I Won't Hold Your Hand. And that's when it all just blew up. Mm. And then it blew up. And then, well, it had already been blowing up in England really nicely. Right. Um, in America, uh, their American affiliate of their English record label, EMI, kept turning down their stuff because they believed that Americans were not interested in that kind of sound. Right. Um, very forward-looking record company thinking. Um, and finally, I guess they decided that with Beatlemania sort of exploding all over England right. and being written about in, in the New York Times and Time and Newsweek and uh, you know, starting to get coverage on American television even, that maybe they should rethink whether they take the fifth single, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Wow. And they decided to take it, and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. So a little risk and a big game. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, there was basically no risk for them. No. And, uh, because, you know, keep in mind that by the time they decided to take it, I Want to Hold Your Hand had already had advance orders of a million copies wow. in England. And England is, you know, it's little. Right. You can say that now, Billy's gone. Oh. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and uh, so what did they have to lose, really? You know, this, this, this couldn't be that much of a flop in the U.S. Right. So, um, so they did it, and it was, you know, the hit that we know, and came over here. And what was their biggest hit ever? <sighs> How are you defining biggest? Yeah. I guess sales or it's so chart hard to number? Say. Yeah. Yeah. On the I charts. Mean, I want to hold your hand or she loves you might be up there, but you know, every everything they do. Hey Jude, out, like wasn't yeah, that a so giant long. one? They were all pretty giant. I mean I in, in the US, um, I think all of them went to what number one. In the UK 
the first one that didn't go to number one was Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, um, and that probably was a, sort of a fluke of timing. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, they just, I mean, I don't think they did any bad records. There's, no. There's nothing, uh, you know, and I've, I've heard their records gazillions of times. Right. And, have never gotten tired of any of them. Yeah. So, um, you know, even something like Revolution Number no. Nine. I love Number no. Nine. Yeah, yeah. No, no, Most people don't like it because I it's, love it's it. not like a song, you know. But um, there's something so quirky and cool about it. It's though. very quirky and cool. And if you, you know, as I did for a lot of my life, listen to classical music all the time. I mean, for new classical music. That's a lot of what you hear. Things. Like now, if the Beatles were all still doing their thing, do you think that they would be? where they are now. Well, um, well, Paul and Ringo are still doing it. I know, but it's different. Um, but it's not just yet. not the same. I mean, we'll never know, but yeah, like... It's, it's so hard to say. Yeah, and, because uh, it ended. Do you think that that had anything to do with this, or do you think not? I, I like, like, wonder whether they would have gotten together like for the Grammy yeah. special, yeah. or if they even would be as celebrated. That's what I mean. That's that's what I mean. I mean you know, the thing is, I, I mean, think, it happened the way it happened, and that's the way it is. But. Right. I think if they had stayed together, if they had managed to sort out their differences and say, you know, we're actually a pretty good band and we have a lot to say, um, I think they would have continued at the top for a very long time because one thing about the Beatles that I think made the Beatles work that has not been quite as operative in their solo careers is that when there were the four of them Magic. There was, well, there was magic, but there was also a critical element, you know? If you brought in something substandard, the other three would say, mm, no, we're not going to do that. Um, whereas now, you know, when the, in their solo careers, each one of them was the boss. Right. And, and no one was going to say no, no matter how Yeah, because they weren't one of them. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. there was no, like, checks and balance. That's right. I like the feeling That's, that Linda was pretty straightforward with Paul and Yoko with John. Yeah. yeah, I mean, John and Paul balanced each other out That's in true. a really interesting way. Yeah. And yeah. then George, poor George. Yeah. I feel like George always had the hardships. Yeah. Um, but you know, towards the end, I think he was beginning to come into his own, and the oh, others recognizing. Yeah, you know? I know. You know, they when they put him. out something on a single, that was a big thing. Yeah. You know? And I think John and Paul both recognized that that, that was a great song. It's a great song. It's it's an yeah. amazing song. In fact, Frank Sinatra used to refer to it as my favorite Lennon McCartney song. Oh <laughs> well, of course he would, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. Wow. So the names of your books are. Okay, um, the first one is called The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. Okay. And it was published by Fight and Press in 1995, and then it was reissued a couple of years ago. Um, and the new one is um, Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, right. Changed Everything. And, and what are you going to be doing at the Fed? <laughs> um, I'm on a couple of panels with other authors. Which is always fun because, you know, especially at the moment, there are so many great Beatles books out. Yeah. Um, Mark Lewison will be there, and um, Bruce Spicer, and really a whole lot of people um, who've written great Beatles books. I mean, there, there is a huge bookshelf now of right. really good Beatles books, you know, even if you've read them all, things keep coming out. Do you have a favorite one besides your own? Um, you know, I really enjoy, had, had been waiting for, like everybody else, the first volume of Mark Lewison's um, three-part biography. The first part only goes up to 1962. Um, but it's just a fascinating read. And uh, it comes in two versions. One is like 960 pages, and the other is 1,700 pages. Wow. And I read the 960-page mm, one because like it was... Like War and Peace, huh? Yeah. You know, and now I'm reading the 1700-page one. So that's like Gone with the Wind or something? Uh, it's like two Gone with the Wind. <laughs> oh my god. Well, today is National Corn Chip Day. Great. And we'd love to share a corn chip with you if you could Absolutely. share a skeleton from your closet. Well, a skeleton. Come on. You know, I mean, it's New York. We don't have room for skeletons. <laughs> well, come on. you got to make a few, right? I suppose. Um... Do you ever run a red light? 
and get caught? Well, um, I actually got a speeding ticket for um, what I was actually going was 110. <gasps> Good for you. Ooh, where was this? <laughs> yeah. It was on the way from Syracuse to New York. You're a badass, huh? Uh, well, in the know, car. I had it was in a Chevy Impala, which was you know had, a pretty, had a pretty powerful engine. I hope it wasn't red. It wasn't red then. It became red because um, after my license was suspended, I decided. <laughs> <laughs> Have another chip, my friend. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you know, and, and basically, it's very funny because. The police didn't actually catch me at 110. That was as, as high as I got. Um, but I then came, it was, on, it was on Interstate 17. Okay. And I came over a hill. And as I came over the hill and started coming down, I could see the police. Oh. It was like, you know, four in the morning. So it was light, but it was empty. Right. And the policeman was standing right in the middle of the highway. Oh, like waving With you his down. hands on his hips. Oh. And he waved me over when I got down, and he said, so what are you doing? And I said, well, I just wanted to see how fast it went, you know? And I, and I took it up to where it began shaking a little bit. Oh, that, that was you are ten. brave. Um, well, I'm brave or stupid, because that was also an area where there were deer all over the place. Uh, and if a deer came out and you're going 110, yes. I wouldn't be here today. That's true. So um, he said, you know, we clocked you at 97.7. There you go. And I said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> and he said, but you know what? We're going to give you a ticket for 90. How kind of him. Because at 90, they'll suspend your license for a month, but at 97.7, you'd lose it. Wow! So, so he, was, he was very nice. That was so, nice. Yes. Good for you. So what's your website that people can buy your books? and? Ah, uh, well, okay. The new one, um, and in fact the old one, you can get at Amazon. Um, and the new one also is on iTunes. Just do a, a search for um, Cozen, that's K-O-Z-I-N-N, -N, and got that something, and it should come up. Um, otherwise, uh, you can read my stuff most days on nytimes.com. Good for you. Yeah. Wow. And I'm hanging around on Facebook. Sounds good. So would you like to push a button? Okay, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> That's to the cop. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, and I want to thank Ida for bringing this all together. My thank pleasure. you so much, Ida. This is the day of the fest for the Beatles fans. Thank you, Vivek and Billy J. Kramer and Alice Keston and Michelle and Jessica Lap Lapidus and... The furious few, ferocious. We had that, yeah. Ferocious few, yes. And Mark Hudson and Susan Ryan and Alan Cousin and Otto Shrunken Head. Caroline, I love you. And Juan, gracias mucho. Because yes, we know what happens. Only what what happens at Otto stays at Otto's, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll see you next week. Yes. Happy, happy Beatles fan fest. Have a great time. Woo! Uh, thank you. I get high, I get low, there's nothing else.